Hi, and welcome to the very first episode of A Liminal Space. My name is David Fideli, and in this episode, I'm in discussion with Yara Lee. Yara is an activist, filmmaker, and founder of Cultures of Resistance Films, whose mission is to create and distribute films that advance public awareness about issues of social and economic justice, and showcase creative efforts to promote peace and protect human rights. She's also the founder of Cultures of Resistance Network, an independent organization that promotes global solidarity and aims to promote and support organizations, activists, and artists who seek a more peaceful, just, and democratic world through creative resistance and nonviolent action. Yara's work takes her all around the world, very often putting herself in risky and dangerous situations. In 2010, Yara was involved in the Gaza Freedom Flotilla, where nine pro-Palestinian activists were killed by Israeli naval forces and dozens more injured, Yet she and her team still managed to smuggle their film footage off the ship, which was later screened at the United Nations. Some of the things we discuss include the power of film and art as tools for social and political change, the importance of remaining independent in your work and fighting for what you believe in, the sacrifices required when doing this sort of work, and the realities of dealing with rejection as an artist and filmmaker. At the end of the discussion, Yara also shares some invaluable tips for anyone considering entering into this space of activism and filmmaking. Yara speaks with an optimism and positivity that is absolutely contagious, and it's impossible to not be touched, moved, inspired and motivated by her words, and more importantly, her actions. Before we begin, if you'd like to support this channel, please subscribe below and hit the bell button to be notified of new episodes. And please feel free to leave comments or questions. But for now, make yourself comfortable as we enter a liminal space. So Yara Lee, welcome to a liminal space. Um, it's a pleasure to, to have you here. You're the very first, very first guest on this new video podcast. My understanding is you're in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Yeah, I came as a transit visa and it became my permanent home. <laughs> okay. I was a jury member in a festival in Peloponnesus in Greece and I was just trying to do post-production in front of the computer. So I asked my assistant to send me to a warm place and she says, here is Jeddah, you can just take a non-stop flight. I was like, oh, this is my dream to go to Saudi Arabia. It's such a red tape, impossible to enter country. So I wish, but I'm sure it's going to be impossible. And then she says, let me look. And then she's like, oh, they opened online visa. I was like, what? <laughs> I'll believe when I see it, try to get one. And she got it. And then in two days I was here and I've been here ever since, since the uh, end of January wow. because of Corona and Corona uh, curfew quarantine here is very strict. So we had even periods of 24 hour curfew. <laughs> so the last four months I've been going out, maybe I went out four times just to go to the supermarket. <laughs> wow. And how, uh, what state of the curfew is it now? Are you still under curfew or what's the situation so now? So finally, finally a few days ago, they lifted because I think capitalist talks louder, you know. The cases are going up because they're testing everybody. But uh, I think there's just too much pressure, you know, but things are under control health wise. I mean, despite the fact that the numbers go up. But I have Brazilian passport and US passport, and these are the two worst countries for Corona. So I'm like, I'm better off here. Yeah, wow. And, <laughs> I mean, and in Brazil, Brazil is 45,000 cases a day, new yeah. cases, and the Brazilian president also just was diagnosed positive yeah. so it's really maddening you know so by way of introduction i mean that's a that's a, a perfect introduction you are brazilian my understanding is of korean heritage you're brazilian and you are um well i would call you a documentary filmmaker and activist is that how you would describe yourself yeah, an activist filmmaker because we gotta use all the tools <laughs> yeah. to provoke a little bit of positive change. I mean, I know it's all humble, but uh, we try through music, photography, dance, poetry, whatever it takes. And I think uh, film is a very complete media because you have audio, you have visual, you have intellectual 
stimulation, emotional stimulation. So I've been going for that. And did you did you enter this space from the activist space or from the filmmaking and art space? Actually, I used to run an international film festival in Sao Paulo, Brazil in the 80s. So I come from the arts and cultural world. I was always scouting for new talents and trying to bring new films to Brazil. And I was like, okay, what well, would it be to go behind the camera, you know, after a few years running the festival. So I started making some short films and they were also very pop culture and cult, arts and culture. But with time, organically, you get to see that the world is collapsing and you have to use arts and culture to go beyond arts and culture. That's when I started to really focus on social justice and activists through filmmaking. And I think that's something that will stay with me until, you know, I'm no longer physically in this world because it's my raison d'être. That's what I do day and night. <laughs> yeah. I mean, one of the, look, we've never had the opportunity to meet in person, but um, our films um, have been shown quite a bit together, including with Cinema du Desert, which is a, an Italian organization who I, I hope to, to have on this podcast as well. Um, and they do amazing, amazing work. Um, they have a solar powered truck that they drive across Africa and various other places, showing films, documentaries, also children's films, a lot of films about migration. Um, and they are able to bypass what I would say was a more mainstream, um, or, you know, cinema industry and be able to, 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 to let regular people in villages and so forth, you know, get to experience, get to experience films. And I think that um, my understanding of, of the, your approach to filmmaking is very much in, in line with, with this outside of the sort of the film industry. Would that be, would that be a fair comment? Absolutely. They are very much our like long term partners. And in fact, they were the ones who did the very first screening, outdoor screening, I mean, in a circus, <laughs> uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, post uh, Corona in Italy. So they launched the whole series of Cinema Mobile with our new film, Stock in Chernobyl. Yeah, wow. So it, yeah, so they just had a screening in Italy. And as you know, in Italy, Corona was terrifying too. So they're finally slowly going back to life. And I was very honored to be the first film that they started the series this summer. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, they, screened, uh, they screened in Burkina Faso, where we also do some partnerships with the farming, you know, because they do a lot of farming, uh, um, grassroots farming projects there as well. So we partnered with them not only in filmmaking, but also grassroots yeah. farming and tree growing and so forth. <laughs> so I wanted to, um, I wanted to, uh, there's a name of one of your films that I, I wanted to mention the name. And then I would like you to maybe not just talk about that particular film, but perhaps just the sentence in, in, in context of all the work that, that you do. And the sentence is, when elephants fight, the grass suffers. Yeah, it's an African proverb that applies to every war we have in this world, you know. And many times people ask me, when you make a film about Syria, are you with Assad? Are you against Assad? You know, and I'm like, I'm not with any politicians. I am with the people. Because at the end of the day, people are the ones who become the grass, you know, when yeah. you have all these proxy wars and all these countries fighting and the people who have nothing to do with all these fights are the ones that get trampled. So I think it's a very wise African proverb that applies to every war and every conflict in this world. And I think what we citizens of the world have to do is to support the people who get displaced, killed, and you know, they become internally displaced, they become refugees. And throughout my whole life, I've been making films about the Sahrawi people in Western Sahara who have been, you know, occupied by Morocco for so many years. And there's a huge media blockade. Most people don't even know Western Sahara is a country. Yeah. Most people have never heard Moroccan occupation of Western Sahara. Yeah. So I try to bring, you know, some of these big issues that are completely off the radar and, um, particularly like uh, Western Sahara is the last colony in the African continent. And uh, um, the Palestinian case is also another one and Kashmir occupied by India, Pakistan and then China. 
And um, yeah, like the last time I was in Solomon Islands making a film even about, that touches about, uh, talks about a little bit uh, the occupation of Indonesia in West Papua, which is another place off the radar. So I'm trying to kind of bring global solidarity and get all these occupied countries to work together and learn about each other's conflicts and try to unite and uh, join forces and also to get citizens of the world. I think the Palestinian conflict is very well known, but not many people know about West Papua or, you know, Western Sahara or, or Kashmir even, you know, so we need still, we have so much information in the world, but we still don't know anything. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's an uphill battle. And is that where you're, um, do you come from, do you see yourself as providing information? Do you see yourself as providing entertainment? Do you see yourself as fighting politically? Um, where do you sort of see the films that you that you make? And are you trying to concretely do something? Or, uh, yeah, what's, what's your approach? Yes, um, I think, you know, first step is to educate people. And the, but the second part is that to get action on the ground. A lot of times people watch and the, the films and they say, oh, I'm so inspired. I learned so much. And I'm always like, okay, but what are we going to do about learning so much, you yeah. know? So to me, it's very important to be very action oriented and uh, to bring young people to do the action because ultimately the world belongs to young people. And, uh, but you know, we have to be humble as filmmakers. We know that we are planting seeds of love and solidarity. Sometimes maybe the fruits will be collected in the next generation when I'm not even around physically, but we have to keep on going. And uh, uh, parallel to the filmmaking, I also realized that it's very important to do action <laughs> from our own side. So we started a foundation called Cultures of Resistance Foundation. So I try to not just document the people and their occupation or conflict, but also work with them long-term wise. So we create scholarships, we support some of the NGOs, we support some of the activists featuring the film. We do lots of projects with them long-term, you know, like if a musician in the film wants to do a new record, we try to bring some support. And uh, we are now doing a film uh, with Lesotho, this tiny little country in uh, Southern Africa. So we created the Cultures of Resistance Award. So each of them will get a little cash award so they can push forward with the good things they are doing. Mm -hmm. This is a new film that will be uh, 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 launching this month called From Trash to Treasure, How to Turn Negatives into Positives, which is also my motto, you know? Everything that goes bad, we have to draw a lesson from it and use it for a positive outcome. Yeah. So I stay positive and hopeful. And well, this is, <laughs> this is so obvious. And I feel I need to ask you this question. Um, you've made many more films than I have. You've been doing this for longer than I have. But you seem to have this, even just in this conversation, this, and I mean, you were telling me you were up until 5.30 last night or this morning. I mean, you, you and, and I know... Um, I'm a good friend, I don't know if you know, of Jal, who I believe was editing one of your, one of your films in Portugal. And he's yeah. telling me about your work ethic and your positivity. And I want to know, I want to know how, where do I go to, to, to the well to, 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 to get some of this positivity? Because I find that working on these really tough issues and struggles and with people that are in, you know, different situations or degrees of suffering or vulnerable people, it really personally takes a, a toll on me. Um, and I'm currently in the middle of a small break in some way of filmmaking and for various reasons, also Corona, it's one of the reasons that I'm starting to, to do this podcast to, to get back in. Um, so is there a way that you're able to, is this just something in your nature? Are you, are you born with this positivity and, or have you learnt to take care of yourself that you need to take care of yourself in this space as well? Yeah, a lot of times, you know, even when I post about something outrageous, people like, uh, ah, anger and, you know, and I'm like, guys, to cry, to be angry, it's not going to solve anything. We have to channel all this outrage into positive action, you know? 
And I know it's very difficult because the tendency as humans is to just become very outraged and upset and, and you know, sometimes we even freeze and don't know how to handle, you know, so we just give up, we just commit suicide, we just, you know, withdraw from this world. But I think hope is the only option. And I think we have to always find these little cracks on the wall about taking the positivity and the hope. I think uh, maybe it's just something that you as a mindset, you know, that you have to really yeah. use that strategy to keep on going because at the end of the day is the game of resilience, is the game of perseverance. And who is more perseverant is the one that will win the war, you know? So I always tell people, don't, don't just be negative. Use that. Like, you know, I was in this Gaza flotilla and these Israeli commandos came and they killed nine people in the middle of international waters, all our colleagues. And people asked me, weren't you like super scared? You know, they come and they start shooting. I was like, no, I was outraged. I was not scared, you know, and that just fueled me to become even more, you know, concerned and action oriented. And to me, all these things that come against me actually push me to become even more focused on the causes. Yeah. And I think this is a good strategy for survival and it's a good strategy to also to keep your equanimity because at the end of the day, everybody wants to knock you down and you have to just find that equanimity position that nothing will bring you down. And when the end they bring you down, you just resurrect it from the ashes, which is what I do all the time. You know, <laughs> I mean, I had so many life threatening experiences and I'm always resurrected from the ashes. <laughs> yeah. And, and how do you feel in those, in those experiences, um, of in the end you are there or, or let me ask you i i would say that you are there to document something i mean that that that's why you're there and in these um times of of risky encounters and on the the guard the gaza freedom flotilla was very dangerous and not dangerous in a academic way i mean people were killed it's a very real risk and a lot of people don't fully appreciate um, what you do and the places that you put yourselves in, that, that you put you and your team in. And at the end of the day, would it be right to say, unless you actually bring footage or bring evidence or bring documentation out from that scenario, um, you're just putting people potentially at risk for... for for no reason. So how do you go about that? I mean, how do you get footage out of very risky places or how were you able to, I know you were, but how did you get this footage out? For example, in this Gaza freedom flotilla? Yeah. I mean, we have to use strategies each time, you know, like um, when I was in the occupied territories of Western Sahara, you know, we were doing all this, uh, interviews and the word was starting to get out that a filmmaker activist was able to enter the occupied territories so we just had to you know accelerate everything get the footage and go you know i took the bus in that particular case i took the bus early in the morning where everybody's asleep so they couldn't find me in the bus and i didn't take the plane because they would basically just deport me right away you know and uh, when I was in Nigeria documenting the, the, the people in the Niger Delta with their Kalashnikovs and everything, I was actually more scared of the government because they would be the ones who would also confiscate my footage. I was not scared of dealing with the you know, people who had the Kalashnikovs and were blowing up the you know, uh, oil stations, uh, demanding uh, more justice for this area. And with the Gaza, it was the same. I, I told my cameraman, they're going to confiscate everything. Don't use the big HD card, use the small SD card, you know. And uh, in the convolution of things, I thought he would forget, but he actually did remember. And he was able to kind of hit, you know, behind the elastic of the underwear. And since he was Serbian and blonde, blue eyes, the Israelis mm. were more occupied with the Muslims, you know. So we were able to get the only footage out 
but you're right that uh, the, the risks are so much, you know, and at some point I say, hey, I don't mind putting my life in risk, but I really don't like the idea that I have a cameraman, a sound man, a production coordinator sometimes with me. And uh, so this is the only thing. <laughs> so now I'm happy that we have a small camera. Sometimes I can make a film by myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, you know, as far as me, I already took this decision. I don't have a family. I don't have biological children waiting for me at home and finding out the mom is in jail again, you know. So I make some very personal decisions how I can live this life without causing too much suffering around me. But, um, you know, crew members are also like family members and sometimes they come and they do filmmaking with me thinking they're going on an adventure and then I try to tell them this is not adventure, this is war, you know. And they just realize when things are happening on the ground. So it's been a very difficult, challenging situation. And also to me, it's very important not to harm the people that are featured in the film. So sometimes I have to blur their faces. Sometimes I have to take them out of the film because I'm very respectful, you know? It's not about just me being this amazing filmmaker that brings all this incredible, impossible footage. If this is gonna hurt them, I prefer to take it out even if the film will suffer, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's a constant thing. And I think that we filmmakers, we have to be very responsible and very uh, respectful and really understand each case and, and you know, make decisions, but um, still try to bring the strong content without harming people. Yeah, That's I mean, very important. there are two main things that, 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 that brought to my mind from, from that. The first is, um, I, I also, I've made a film in Morocco, um, looking at migration and, and in the end we were, I, I had a, a Moroccan, um, oh, he's my dear friend now, but uh, as all, everyone you en end up working with becomes dear friends in, in, in this space because, you know, you spend days, weeks, months, sometimes years in very, um, not just dangerous, but very emotional, you know, um, environments and, and and we got arrested by the Moroccan military and police. And what I worked out was that in the end, it was actually me that provided more safety to my Moroccan friend by the Moroccan authorities, because I, I, I have two passports. I'm Australian with Italian heritage. Um, and I believe that they didn't treat him as badly as they would have because I was there. So in some way we have this, um, well, we're very privileged because of our documents sometimes. Um, and Well, that was not the case. I have this American passport. When we were in jail in Israel, the American embassy came with a list of lawyers that basically said, sign everything Israel asks you to sign. Otherwise, here's the list of lawyers, $500 an hour and good luck. <laughs> right. So, so that didn't help to have a, a strong American passport. <laughs> But luckily, I had a Brazilian passport, and it was during the you know left wing government of Lula. So the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs was very kind and sent someone, and you know looked after me afterwards. And that was very helpful. Right. <laughs> but I wouldn't think that the Bolsonaro <laughs> government, if I was in trouble in Israel, <laughs> the Bolsonaro government would do anything on my behalf. <laughs> yeah. So you know, it really depends. My cameraman was from Spain when we went to the occupied territory of Western Sahara. And he was very scared because it was official that the Spanish government would not give any support to people who are meddling in this conflict, you know, with the Western Sahara. So it's this diplomatic uh, thing is something that it really depends on the uh, circumstances at hand. <laughs> yeah, amazing. And you, you always work with, how do, how do you work with local people? Do you have your team of, of cameramen and sound people or do you hire people wherever you go or how does that work across your film? Yeah, I try, I try to always involve local crew members. When I was in Pakistan making a film about the porters of K2 Mountain, I was the only foreigner. My cameraman, my salesman, my production coordinator, my editor, everybody was Pakistani. Yeah. And I feel very proud because, <laughs> you know, then you can make a film that is very genuine and and not just a foreigner coming, trying to make a film about them. So this is very important to me. Yeah. And, and, and that was actually exactly the second part of the question. How do you feel as, a, as an outsider going to Pakistan? Or uh, what are the challenges or the advantages that you see um, 
that you have as as this outsider? Or perhaps do you feel an outsider? Do you feel that you're an outsider? <laughs> yeah, I blend right in, you know? I spent some months in Pakistan <laughs> and everybody feels I'm just like a Pakistani <laughs> without speaking the Urdu. <laughs> I'm here now in Saudi Arabia, you know, and I'm just like a sister to everybody here. Everybody feels comfortable. <laughs> so I think this is this is the, the greatest thing, you know, my ability to just merge with the culture and just take a humble approach of learning and being curious. I'm never coming to dictate things or with a script, you know. So I think the fact that I come with the curiosity to learn also makes them more open because I'm not like, this obnoxious foreigner that thinks knows better, you know. Yeah. I think this approach is very important, and uh, and just kind of let them tell the story, you know, instead of me imposing a script, you know. And, and this is the amazing thing about documentary filmmaking: you don't know where the film is going to take you because people will take it to different corners that you had no idea you would be there. Do you have some idea of a story before you go, or are you? arriving with really an open uh, every, open mind, open heart, open ears to, to discover the best way to tell any story. Yeah, no, I even call myself like a parachute filmmaker, you know, <laughs> I just land <laughs> abruptly. <laughs> Sometimes with as little knowledge as most people, you know, like when I went to Burkina Faso, I was gonna make a film about the farmers and I didn't know about this incredible history that they were just coming from, you know, using, you know, popular insurrection to get rid of a president that was glued to power for so many years and all the intricacies of their activism and anti-colonialism and, you know, so it, it's like a, a learning process that a lot of times you learn on the ground, you know, and so I'm very much a parachute filmmaker, but I have the ability of also making contact with people very quickly so in Burkina Faso case people are like you've been here for one week how come you know the whole arts and culture community <laughs> I was like well because I met you and you introduced me to five more and these five more introduced me to ten more and yeah. now I know the whole activist world here <laughs> yeah I think it's um it's 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 totally refreshing both to talk to you and to to hear your approach because it's the opposite in many ways to what you may learn in a more traditional either filmmaking school or even in a filmmaking industry and fe and television and broadcast and even festivals sometimes when it comes to funding because one of the craziest things that, that you know any documentary filmmaker has to face if they're trying to get funding is that they're asked, what is the film about? And you have to write a film and you have to provide almost a script of a film. And... It's the the parachute filmmaker does not fit at all in this in this model. So is that you are independent? Cultures of Resistance is an independent um, organization and filmmaking group. Is that why you work in this independent space to 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 be less um, bound by constraints and to be able to 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 move quickly or? Why have you chosen to, to work in the way that you have? Yeah, you're actually so right. You know, if you are going for funding, you have to write a script and, you know, and all that. And I'm sure a lot of people, filmmakers, they, you know, they write a script and when they go to those places, they end up having to do something totally different, you know, because life evolves in unpredictable ways. But it is true that the starting point is having a script to convince the broadcasters in my case, I am also very, very uh, unusual in that particular situation because um, 30 years ago, I started a SRI investment, socially responsible investing. And with that, people were like making fun of me. Oh, how can you make film? You know, how can you make money investing in positive things? If you want to make money, you have to invest in stock market for weapons and pharmaceuticals and tobacco and, you know, alcohol and things that will bring you a lot of money, but not necessarily, you know, positive for society. And I was like, no, we can invest in renewable energy. We can invest in cutting edge technologies that have, you know, idealistic things in mind and we can do a lot of things. And so, you know, I started 30 years ago and then it paid off, you know, 30 years later because, you know, I was able to 
have this kind of like foresee what were the needs of the world and kind of take a more cutting edge approach to stocks and bonds and so wow. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need to submit my script to broadcast I make my very low budget films and uh, I make it independent independently and uh, when I was in a uh, um, Solomon Islands, I was talking to some journalists and they were like, yeah, these people, they want to do a climate change story. And the editor sends the journalists here for three days to cover this whole Melanesia, Polynesia, <laughs> Micronesia. So they have to be very much narrow minded and just like regurgitate what they already know. There's no time for learning anything new, you know. And in my case, it's the opposite. Sometimes if I need to take a whole year on the ground to understand and then make a film, I'll do it. Sometimes I, I actually don't need, I, I just do it in like a month, something that most filmmakers take a year. Yeah. So, but I have this ability to monitor the progress and what kind of time is needed to get the story and the filmmaking done. And this is definitely something that uh, is very unusual and special about the way I go about filmmaking. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's special, it's unique, it's 100% inspiring. Um, yeah, it, it, myself, I've I've always self-funded my films, and I did uh, my last film was done through crowdfunding. Um, so I come from, in some way, the same the same spirit. The idea of waiting or writing and then waiting, and and I mean, in in some of these stories, it's almost um, the I like some stories need to be told now. Documentary is documenting, you know, a moment in time, something that's occurring now. This whole concept that you can that you have to wait many many months and 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 keep revising your script and and getting bits and pieces of money. Uh, yeah, I mean it's 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 a traditional way of filmmaking, but I I actually believe that we're still trapped in this old thinking of how things were done, and they were done that way because they had to be done that way. You had to have a huge camera and sound guy or woman and then you had to go to the studio and you had to pay so much per hour for the editing suite and um you know the things all of that process now can be literally done on a tiny camera and a laptop because that's how that's how yeah. i do my do my work so i know that it can be done in that way um but i don't think enough people are either aware of it or just they're still stuck in this old way of, of, of thinking. But then there's a big challenge if you are getting your funding through a broadcaster, you know that at the end of the day your, your film will have an audience, it will be broadcast. So how do you go about this, this, this challenge that every one of us has, which is how do you get people to get their eyes to watch your films? Yeah, that's always the biggest challenge because you can produce films, but how you get the audience. So we also created this great, like, cumbersome grassroots movement to get our films uh, watched. You know, like, uh, we have someone in our, you know, organization that literally one by one tells people in our Facebook, you know, Realm and Instagram to watch the film. Here's the link. Now we decided to become self-distributor and we put our films uh, online on YouTube and, uh, and just kind of notify everybody. And uh, we do a lot of screenings in the basement, in the classroom, outdoors, film festival, <laughs> whatever it takes. And the numbers are cumulative, you know, yeah. you get 40 people, you get 10 people, you get 500. And if you look at the list of screenings, we basically show each of our films in 100 countries every year. Now, with Corona, we had to go indoors and just do everything online. But in fact, again, we are trying to turn negative into positive. When we decided to go self-distribution through YouTube, we had like 35,000 people watch this talk in Chernobyl on the launch. And I was like, oh, I will never get that in physical screenings. <laughs> so at the end, it was like, wow. So actually, this is a good way, you know, to get people to watch our little films because they're so grassroots. They don't have sales agents. They don't have distributors. And it's so difficult to get people to 
take the bicycle or take the train or take the subway to go wash our films in a physical space at a particular time, you know? So at the end, this, this crazy online launch makes a lot of sense. And we are now going to launch all our films on YouTube and just make every campaign online and, and get people to see from the comfort of their home and convenience, convenience of their time. Yeah. So we were, uh, we were very happy. 35,000 people watched Stock in Chernobyl launch. And uh, K2, for example, this film I made in Pakistan, we had on YouTube. And you know, for a few years, we had accumulated maybe 4,000 people views. All of a sudden, something triggered inside <laughs> that it, it went to 100,000, you know, just because a mountaineer or another film would take it back somehow or somewhere it a went crazy, viral somehow. A crazy <laughs> YouTube algorithm that we have no idea exactly how it operates. Yeah. I have an experience. It from 4,000 4, to 100,000. Yeah. It was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and what about, I know I follow your journey online on social media and you i don't know do you do you consider yourself do you have a home or are you a nomad in 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 both spirit and also in practice and i know you travel as much as possible for film screenings as well as as, as making your films so um yeah is there something well i believe there's something really special about attending as many film screenings as possible obviously because of the discussion and and people can can understand that it wasn't you know this film just wasn't magically made. Here is the human that, that, that had to blood, sweat and tears, you know, to, to produce this. Um, and I know that that's something very dear to, to me. So how do, you, how do you manage this space of trying to attend screenings yourself? Yeah, you need a lot of physical and mental stamina, mm -hmm. you know, because people from outside, they're always like, oh, I mean, you should have your life traveling around, but it takes a lot of energy. Yeah. <laughs> but I've done this, you know, all my life since I'm 19 years old, I've been on the road, I cover most of the world and I want to see all over again. But um, with Corona, I also kind of like paradigm shift, I proved that I can be sedentary because in four months I haven't left my room. <laughs> That's fast. Yeah. So I, and, and would you say that, is that the first time, for example, since you were 19 that you've spent, wow. And, and, and could you imagine that you could have successfully done this? Or, or if someone had have told you six months ago that you'd have to stay in your room for four months, what would you have, have told them? Yeah. And this the thing life is about adapting you know and i think this is also survival thing and how you can find happiness in the most odd circumstances and um, in the other circumstances you have to find ways like now i find happiness having a cup of coffee that i can make at home mm -hmm. <laughs> you know how i can take you know a little bit more sleep despite the fact not a lot of sleep <laughs> But uh, you have to adapt, and this is the game. And uh, you know, if I can move around, I'll move around. If I can't, I'm just so grateful that I, I'm able to self quarantine. You know, because most people, you know, in crowded countries like India, Bangladesh, they don't even have the ability to self isolate and not be, you know, susceptible to the contagion. And uh, the fact that I have my basic needs, which is food, running water, electricity. It's already amazing. I'm so grateful, you know. Mm. So life is about extremes, you know. Sometimes you're moving, sometimes you're standing still. <laughs> and what's your what's your next extreme? Do you have? A, a, are you able to leave Saudi Arabia now, or do you have a project, or you're going home, or you you still unsure of your neck of your of your move from here? Well, Corona was a paradigm shift, epiphany too, you know, because I realized the most important thing that we humans have to do is to lower our carbon footprint. And making so many films and traveling so much is a very heavy carbon footprint. So I would like to take the approach and that, that I also advise to everybody to do less, to consume less, to produce less, to go slower which is something very hard <laughs> to impose on myself because I'm always like, fast moving, doing a lot. <laughs> but 
but Mother Earth is heavy, you know, and Mother Earth just wants us to slow down and let the animals roam free. <laughs> Let's cage the humans so the animals can roam free. <laughs> So I'm willing to take that uh, sacrifice and, uh, you know, and not just be go, 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 go. Just kind of do all the efforts to kind of like be lighter, like light footprint. I'm thinking actually of, um, you know, down the road, which actually has been a dream for a few years already to become a farmer and maybe create a community space where young people can co come and learn about getting their hands in the earth <laughs> because we are too distant from our basic needs which is like good food without pesticides agrotoxics we don't know anything about forestry biodiversity we don't know anything about how to grow carrots tomatoes you know we know about all the fancy brands and logos around the world but we don't know about you know how to get things to come from earth <laughs> to feed us and farmers are the most important people in our lives. They're the ones who sustain us, you know? So I was thinking that now that I'm like a, becoming a senior person, let the young people travel and you know, just kind of, <laughs> well, I'm just gonna like maybe be very settled down with, you know, grow some trees that will take 10, 20 years to grow. Yeah. <laughs> Plant some trees and uh, let them grow. It sounds- and yeah. It sounds amazing. I mean, I, I see something very interesting in, in what you're saying because um, in my own life, in my own, my filmmaking, I, I, my original films were about environmental issues. And, and then I made a film about electronics and I was trying to make co social commentary on the way the world is going and disconnection. And, but in the process, I found myself totally disconnected be yeah. through my filmmaking. <laughs> so I wanted my filmmaking to show others to use the filmmaking as an, as an example. And now I feel I'm permanently attached to a computer and, and to technology. And so it's a very strange paradox perhaps, or just strange situation. And, and so hearing, hearing you say that doesn't surprise me at all, knowing your work ethic. And, uh, you know, I imagine a lot of what you do is also very reliant on technology both the film too much yeah yeah <laughs> i keep saying how can we have offline <laughs> life <laughs> but it's it's difficult because you've just you've also told me that youtube and online is the is the is the way of getting films to audiences so it's a very um yeah it's a challenging space i i, I think honestly i think that it's from a filmmaking perspective and online and audience and independent and distribution I think there's a, just a big question mark at the moment. No one's really sure if cinema, as in the, 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 the building with seats, and is going to you know, keep going. Are we, are we Netflix? Is it YouTube? Is it independent screenings? Is it television? Um, very interesting. But I must say, I felt myself get about 10% karma when I heard that you want to get into farming and, and you know, more in touch with the with the land and I'm hoping this podcast can, can touch all of these issues. Um, and I'm totally honored. Like this is, this was even more inspiring and amazing than, than I could have imagined. And, and I thank you. I know you're so, you're so busy. I wonder if, would you mind if um, I just asked you one, one more question? Yeah, go ahead. It's just, what would you, I mean, it's the cliche question, but I think it's really, really important to ask and I'd love to hear your thoughts. What would you tell, you know, anyone that's watching this or people that are thinking about like entering this, this space, either of documentary or activism, because they don't have to go hand in hand a lot. Um, you, you, you are just so amazing to be able to be so full of energy to, to do this, but what would you tell people? You know, a lot of people think that filmmaking is easy and glamorous and awards and red carpet. And uh, people think activism is standing in a street with a sign and just yelling at, but you know what, what, what this reality really um, means. You, you've been right at the, the coalface and you put your, your body in harm's way when the vast majority of people have never even contemplated doing that. 
So is there anything that you would, um, yeah, like to share on, on that? Well, I think young people have to get a reality, you know, lesson because as you said, you know, a lot of times people from outside are like, oh, this is so cool. This is so incredible. But it's so hard work and so tedious a lot of times because it's about diligence. It's about being very, very committed. And there is a lot of bureaucratic work. There's a lot of legal work from when we make documentaries with, you know, so many people involved. There is a lot of outreach work going and trying to find the audience. There's a lot of database to get everything coordinated. There's so much like tedious work that people don't realize. And I think this is very important because um, people do think, you know, filmmaking and activists is just very bombastic and fun. And it's, <laughs> it's almost like being in the laboratory with a cell and observing a cell <laughs> for like 10 years. <laughs> this is as tedious as we can get because post-production, you know, you're surgery to get all the footage to make sense and then you have to cut the music and the sound cleaning and the mix and the subtitles i mean i get involved in everything sometimes i'm like cleaning subtitles you know like proofreading yeah <laughs> and uh and also i think people have to understand people sometimes send me messages i want to be hired to be a filmmaker an activist and travel the world. I was like, hey, nobody hires me. <laughs> I have to make money somewhere else, you know. This is also another thing. We have to be realistic. It is about having a way of making all these amazing things happen. You have to make money. So sometimes I say, well, maybe you should have a, like a day job and then but you don't need to compromise your arts and culture and your activists because then it can be more pure because the source of the money will come from your commercial work. And then you can do your activist work without any kind of like censorship or concession to be more commercial. So I think these are so many things that people have to understand. And uh, I think the resilience and the diligence and, and the strength, you always come back from the ashes because a lot of times, you know, you'll find yourself like <laughs> completely wiped out or you have to just... <laughs> yeah. And not lose the enthusiasm, but always understand that it's, it's the balance game and it's about everything. So it's not just about one thing. So there is 1% of fun, but there's 99% of hard work. Yeah, hard work. And also, I, I don't think people, I, I don't think a lot of people fully appreciate um, the toll that it can take on, on yourself physically, emotionally. Um, and yeah, this is another thing, you know, people have nice families, nice homes, and they're like, oh, I wish it could be traveling. I was like, you have to make a decision. You cannot have a nice home and a nice family if you're going to be, you know, confront these state terrorist governments under bombs <laughs> and cluster bombs, you know, but people want to have it all. And life is about yeah. give and take, you know, so people have to make hard decisions in life and and stick to that. And have you yeah. found ways in your own life and practice to balance your 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 mental health and to 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 <laughs> to maintain? I mean, I, I if that's an intrusive question, I'm, I'm I'm struggling at the moment with myself in this corona and so much, and and you know I'm realizing that in many ways this is like the hidden um, the hidden killer as well in 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 many issues, not just in in corona, but also this one thing that hardly anybody considers or speaks about is, as a filmmaker, rejection. Rejection is enormous in, in as far as distribution, trying to get your films screened at festivals continually. You know, we only, we use social media to, to present all the successes of our work, but hardly ever is the real struggle, the real toll and the real rejection told and for me that's a big yeah that's a very real part of what we're doing as well absolutely absolutely when i started when i switched from pop culture to arts and culture for activists i got a lot of rejection <laughs> and i was like oh my god they don't like me anymore maybe i'm a bad filmmaker <laughs> but then i realized you can't please all you have to find your niche you know 
especially when I make films about so many obscure issues. How can I get mainstream audience? Yeah. It's impossible. Exactly. And, and rejection is part of daily life. So what I try to do is to really open the realm of, you know, attempts. So like even film festivals. Yeah, we go to a hundred countries and hundreds of festivals because we tried thousands of them. Yeah. <laughs> so each, you know, invitation is accompanied by 50 rejections. <laughs> and this is what we have to get used to it. Don't think you're a bad filmmaker. Don't think people don't you appreciate you, but you have to find your audience and you find your niche. And it's amazing nowadays, there is audience for everything. <laughs> like if you're a lover of habanero pepper, you'll find a community <laughs> that is a lover of habanero pepper. <laughs> there is audience for everything. Yeah, and I think there's a second, not necessarily rejection, but this idea um, of we make film about an issue because we're passionate about it. It's the only, it's the only logical explanation as to why we would leave our friends and our family and our place and we would go with a tiny camera and would sleep on floors and we sleep in buses and we do what we do. It must be because we're passionate about it. It must be because we believe in it. And deep down, it must be because we have, we would, we would love change to, to happen as a result of our, of our work. And the truth is that very often any vis uh, visible or concrete change either doesn't happen or doesn't happen immediately. And that's another form of rejection. I th not rejection so much, but uh, another truth that is hitting any filmmaker that I talk to in this space. Um, and I, yeah. Yeah. How, how are you, would you like to talk, talk to that? Yeah, you know, but instead of being frustrated, just be humble. One person sent feedback, positive feedback. You touch one heart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think in a way we are also underestimating our impact because what we do is very intangible. Maybe somewhere, you know, far away, we are touching people's hearts and minds and we are provoking change that is going to be very gradual. As we started this interview, I just mentioned that Sometimes you plant the seed of love and solidarity and the fruits will be collected generations down the road. So it doesn't happen overnight, but if you go humble approach and you just keep on going, you know, inshallah. 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 <laughs> oh, that's a wonderful way to, yeah. Um, thank you again. I'm really, oh, sorry, before we finish, is there any, would, is there a way that people can, can discover more about your work and watch your films and so forth online? Yes, we are the cultures of resistance, people. Cultures in the plural, because it's about everything, how we can use arts and culture for activism. Okay. So, so Google. Whoever wants to come to our search yeah, YouTube, cultures, YouTube channel yeah. and website and foundation, we are there. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. It's been a real, real pleasure, and even more so that this is the very first episode. and. I love the motivation and the positivity that, that, that you've brought to it. So I say shukran and um, thank you. And um, yeah, good luck with your next uh, little venture or adventure. Thanks for taking the time. Ilalika, masalama. Masalama. Shukran too. Many thanks for watching and please let me know what you thought in the comments below. And once again, if you'd like to support the channel, please subscribe below and hit the bell button to be notified every time I upload a new episode. Thanks again, and we'll see you for the next episode of A Liminal Space.